Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome and thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name, for those of you that don't know me, is Morris Benjamin. I'm the president of the Board of Directors. Tonight's meeting will be a review of the, a lot of the paperwork that you've already received at your doors or online or both. If you have already hooked up to the internet, you're getting a lot of our stuff via the internet and on paper. It's a duplication for now, but it's good, as long as you read it. And I'm hoping that everyone that gets it does read it. Um, up, up here is uh, Brendan Keeney, our general manager, and Walter Mankoff, who will be doing the presentation. You should know that a lot of the information you've been reading was written by Walter, who has done an excellent job. So I'm going to introduce Brendan. Brendan will come up here, say a few words. He will introduce Walter, and after Walter's presentation, we'll be open for your questions, and hopefully we'll be able to answer all of them. Okay, so thank you. Brendan? Thank you, Morris, and good evening, everybody. Uh, we appreciate uh, the attendance, and uh, we have um, a very detailed presentation tonight to explain uh, our HUD loan and uh, our status with the city, uh, 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 just to mention a couple of items. So I'm going to start off with just talking a little bit about, as manager, some of the challenges over the years with our infrastructure and uh, how to pay for our infrastructure. So. Over the years, um, we have had to find innovative ways uh, through refinancing mortgages when interest rates dropped and picking up uh, additional uh, funds to cover projects that we have done over the years, elevators, windows, and other projects, in addition to coupling that with assessments um, that we have had to put on our shareholders to help to cover the cost. And I think it's been somewhat problematic because uh, we don't always um, have the funds that we need to do the work that we need. So we've taken a different approach in the last, I would say, 10 or so years. We have uh, very carefully tried to understand what exactly our capital needs were and to then look at how to finance them and to do this in a planned manner. Uh, it became apparent recently that through the HUD loan, this was going to be a lot easier to do, and Walter's going to get into some of the details of that tonight, um, but I, I think that you'll see that it is uh, a much more structured uh, uh, approach to our capital needs, uh, required by the bank, frankly, the bank requires it as well, and it has given us an opportunity to look at all of our capital infrastructure in significant detail to understand what needs to be done and when it needs to be done and approximately how much is it going to be cost when we need to do it. So over the years, I remember uh, many, many years ago at annual stockholders meetings, we would from time to time get criticisms from cooperators well, we don't do enough advanced planning, and, and, and you'll see tonight as we go through uh, uh, what we're uh, uh, proposing to do here, this is exactly what we have done. And we haven't done it just for 10 years, but we have done it for 20 uh, uh, plus years. And frankly, going much beyond that is unrealistic. And uh, we're going to get into the detail of that tonight. I'm, I'm very encouraged by it. I think that it really puts Penn South in a very financially sound uh, situation, and it also covers all of our capital expenses that we know, all of the big items, underground piping, roofs, electrical upgrades, all of the things that we'll be looking at in our future are taken into consideration here. We've had a series of professional engineers and architects come in and help us put together these reports, help us with the timing as to when the work is needed through doing life cycle analysis on equipment, 
And I think that this is really, if you will, the hallmark of solid planning. And, and I think it's very important, and it will leave Penn South in a very excellent condition well into our future. Uh, I would point out that um, the advantages, uh, Walter will get into some of the detail on that, but there are many. I mean, for example, on the refinancing of our entire debt, uh, we will end up saving approximately $3.3 million a year, and that $3.3 million a year will go towards all of our capital needs in the first 10 years, and it will help us significantly with our capital needs in the second 10 years without having to go to our shareholders for further increases or assessments to cover capital needs. So I think that, that is, is, is very significant. And one of the things I can tell you, uh, and, and we learned it through HVAC, when we approach projects in Penn South because of our size and enormity, and we try to do work with qualified contractors who know what they're doing, it's expensive. Our entire HVAC project ended up costing us about $147 million. And that is a very significant figure, as you're aware. And one of the difficulties that we were confronted with is having borrowed that an enormous amount of money uh, on a 10-year balloon loan. And a balloon loan is a loan that matures after the 10 years, and then you still have a significant amount of debt. We stood to face potentially a very large increase because interest rates over time more probably will go up rather than remaining as they are. And then we would be faced in 2021 with a very significant increase. So the HUD loan essentially has done three things for us. One of the things it has done for us is that it has helped us with the possibility of very large increases when the balloon loan would mature in 2021. It has also helped us with going forward with the affordability of Penn South for incoming shareholders because it slows down the growth in the purchase price as you move into Penn South. So there are a number of uh, benefits to the HUD loan in addition to the savings uh, and the annual savings which will go towards our capital uh, needs. So I think uh, the other aspect that I'd like to just spend a minute on, we had hoped that tonight we'd be able to talk to you about what I'll call a done deal with the city. But we're not, we're still negotiating with the city and I think as cooperators will know from the white paper, uh, we have asked for the city to help us as we extend our contract essentially in two uh, areas, significant areas. One is that when we looked at projects that we have to do into the future, underground piping being one of them, replacing our submeters at some point being another project, we came up with a total of approximately 12 or $13 million as a cost for doing those projects. And unfortunately, there is no J51 benefit under the present rules that one can attain um, for doing those projects. So one of the requests, if you will, that we asked of the city is that they consider as part of a rule change and give us J51 benefit for the underground piping replacement in addition to the submeters. And I believe that we have secured that in the sense that the city has committed that when they do rule changes, they will absolutely take this into consideration. And if they do, and if we get the normal percentage that one gets on these size projects, it probably would be someplace between 25 to 35 percent of the total value of the work and therefore somewhere in the range of about $4 million paid out over the 12-year period. The other significant ask that we have not gotten a full commitment on yet, but we are in discussions and we're very optimistic, in fact, it's with the Office of Management and Budget, is that we get to retain all of our surcharge income. 
We're presently, uh, we split the income with the city, um, and we have made the argument that we are the only cooperative that we know of that's continuing to do that uh, split arrangement. And uh, we have asked the city to consider uh, um, that uh, we would retain all of the, the surcharge funds. And that, of course, would help us tremendously in the next 10 years, and it would help us with some of the costs of capital going into uh, the second 10 years. So uh, I think there's significant, the city, of course, um, is here, has we've had several meetings. They're optimistic. They recognize, recognize that Penn South, and this is something to be proud of, that Penn South is the model for affordable housing in New York City. They talk about us all the time. They recognize that we really are the model. And uh, they're continually in touch with us to find out how we do various things in terms of capital expenditures and such, because they then take that information and give it to other co-ops so that it can benefit them as well. So we have a very pr proud record and one that we can be uh, 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 very happy about. Um, I'm really uh, particularly gratified um, that the opportunity presents itself with this HUD loan to save very significant money to cover much of our capital needs going into the future and that we don't have to go to our shareholders uh, um, to, uh, uh, have the to bear the burden of the costs. I'd like to just point out, uh, because this question was asked of me recently, well, then why didn't we do the HUD loan when we done the large financing back in uh, 2011 and, and, and so on and so forth? Around that time, and we had to do two loans, you'll recall. Well, the HUD loan was not available to us. It was not available to any co-op. In fact, one of the first co-ops to get the HUD loan was River Bay Corporation, which is commonly known as Co-op City. And when we learned about that, we uh, and it took them a long time to close on the loan. Um, but when we learned about that, we immediately started to investigate it and found out that it would be available to Penn South. And I have to tell you, a lot of work has gone into it over this past year, probably even over a year at this point. But we're optimistic that we'll be able to close it in the next couple of months. And Walt will talk to you about the interest rate um, that we're hovering around 3% which is absolutely fantastic. If we end up closing it there, it really will be a wonderful deal for Penn South. So without further ado, let me introduce you to somebody who has worked on this. He's worked on the white paper that went out to all of the shareholders, and he has worked on the PowerPoint presentation that you are seeing tonight. And I kid around with him sometimes that uh, he's probably one of the best employees in the office. Uh, Walter Mankoff does a tremendous job and really uh, the quality of the work is absolutely fantastic and uh, you'll see that tonight with the PowerPoint. So without further ado, Walter Mankoff. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, it's always an honor to talk to our cooperators. It's something I not only do officially, so to speak, but I do it because I enjoy it. And um, I always try to think of something before I start as guiding me in what I'm planning to say. And I have two thoughts tonight, uh, both old, very famous commercials. One is Wendy's Where's the Beef? And um, I'll be putting some beef on the bones that Brendan put before you. And the other is uh, Sims, an educated consumer is a good consumer, except here we'll have an educated cooperator is a good cooperator. So uh, with that brief introduction, let me start the show. And the first thing is why we're here tonight, I think Brendan said it, but we're gonna talk about a win-win situation that's available to Penn South, which is refinancing with a HUD-insured mortgage, extending our contract with the city, and getting city financial help. And we're providing the shareholders with information so they can vote in our advisory 
referendum. First, a bit about the loan. We've applied for what's known as a Section 223F HUD insured self liquidating refinancing mortgage. It's designed specifically for our kind of situation, namely refinancing and existing mortgages. And um, there are many benefits to this. First, this will last for 35 years, at the end of which there will be no, nothing left on the mortgage. It, there'll be no refinancing in 2021, or every 10 years thereafter with potentials for high interest rates. Typically, the lenders don't want to give commercial loans uh, for 25, 30 years the way they do on private homes. And as a business, so to speak, we don't want to also tie ourselves up for too long in case we need additional funding. Here we have a combination that, so to speak, puts everything together. You know, as we're covering our capital needs, we're covering our financing needs, and as Brendan pointed out, there'll be over $3 million a year reduction in debt service, which is gonna pay for our required replacements without burdening the cooperators. An additional feature, apartment prices will grow more slowly than they have been rising. They won't obviously reduce them, but they will rise a little more slowly with the long-term loan and smaller amount of amortization, paying off the principal each year, which automatically gets added to the apartment price. First, let's look at the savings. Right now, we're paying $12.8 million on our present mortgage. The HUD insured loan, 35-year loan at $190 million at 3% interest, will cost roughly $8.8 .8 million a year. That's a total saving of a little over $4 million. In addition, you're required to be take out insurance, which is 0.35% of the principal balance of the mortgage each year. So we start at 665,000 the first year, that will shrink year after year. And the net saving currently, or the first year, will be $3.4 million. Now let's see what we're gonna do with that money. And I say we, the top line shows the saving carried over from the previous page. HUD will require that we put money aside to do the required capital improvements. There's a total of $13.7 million included in the $190 million we're borrowing, which will start the escrow account. And then each year we will have to put somewhere in the neighborhood of about a million six, so that over a 10 year period, there's something like $30 million in the bank, and that will be used for the capital improvements. We also are required to maintain a operating reserve. Right now, our operating reserve is one month's carrying charge. HUD requires three months and that means that we will be protected in case of any emergency or unexpected event. We will have funds on hand without going to the cooperators to uh, ha handle that. And the worst that would have to happen is, is that we would need a slow replacement of the operating reserve until we're back to three months uh, carrying charge in the bank. Finally, on use of the money, the slower amortization is going to reduce apartment prices or slow the growth in apartment prices. That will lead to less income from the first sales assessment, and that's gonna to amount to about $600,000 a year. So all of those things added together, we still have about 450,000 saving, which can be used for other purposes. 
Uh, for example, there's about a million dollars a year in other capital work that the co-op needs to do, which HUD doesn't require, and it's not in the schedule for that reason. But we'll find a good use for the money. Um, this is something Brendan talked about, the HUD required replacements, and that our, we had the inspection done by our engineers and professionals, and they determine what work will be needed and when and what it will cost. And the funds must be put into escrow and then withdrawn when the work is needed on, in accordance with the HUD schedule. And um, as I pointed out previously, they expect to have $26.4 million in required cost and about $30 million in the bank, and that will be adequate to handle it. Here's an idea, just give you an idea of some of the things that we need to replace and what it will cost. Or, um, local Law 11, which we do now, the, uh, for our building facade every five years, they're allowing 2.8 million. Some of our buildings need, will need new roofs, 5.1 million. Underground piping for our dual temperature HVAC system, another 5 million. Elevators. 6.2 million, even though it's not that long ago that we did our elevators, the experts say there's going to be coming up within the next 10 a need to redo them. There are also some changes in laws and building codes that require change. And finally, generators, many of the, some of the generators in our power plants are getting uh, older, they're going to need replacement. So, <clears throat> and other are a lot of small items which I didn't itemize. The grand total is 24 million. <coughs> then they allow for inflation by adding 2% a year to each item, and that comes to a total of 26.4 million dollars. For the second 10 years, uh, I'm not going into, we'll go into the detail list, but it calls for about $46 million in replacements, including inflation. HUD will come or require our inspection of our property about the ninth year. And they may decide that what they've estimated already is not sufficient and add more to it. The loan savings will pay a substantial part of this cost, but not all. But there is available a, what's known as a Section 241 HUD loan for the purpose of providing finances for re capital work on a, when you have one of their basic loans in place. And we've also been promised some city, city help. This is some, give you an idea of some of the work that needs to be done in the second 10 years. As I said, building facades get done every five, so we have it again. Roofing, some of the roofing on the buildings was done first 10. Some of it will be done in the second 10. That includes both the apartment buildings and our commercial buildings with the stores. They're also expecting us to do windows again in our balcony doors. Um, they've allowed four and a half million for that. Then the big item. Our apartment electric, which they're allowing for rewirings and improvements, and that is the biggest item, 19.6 million. It came to 35.4 million total. The inflation allowance was 10.8, and the grand total that is 46.2. Replacements without HUD. Um, the other night at the uh, can uh, candidates meeting, somebody asked, what will we do if we don't get the HUD loan? That was an interesting question, so we decided to answer it tonight as well. The HUD replacements are needed whether we have a HUD loan or not. The mere fact that HUD requires it doesn't mean that you don't need it. And um, the projected cost, as I said, 
was something in the neighborhood of combined first 10, second 10 years, we're talking over $70 million. If there's no HUD loan, obviously we'll have to take out a regular loan to pay for this work. Um, we'll either need a, a, an increase in debt service for this kind of loan, or we'll be taking some assessments possibly. And um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to avoid the HUD loan. We're much better off do, getting the HUD loan since we have to do the work anyway. And the HUD pays it fully for the first 10 years and a large part of what we need to do in the next 10. Extending shelter rent, uh, let me leave the HUD loan a little bit for the moment. Uh, the interest rate on the new loan is a record low 3%. Um, that's possible because HUD insurance insures the lender that we can pay the debt service for the entire 35 years. Without that, they would not be likely to lend us the money either for 35 years or at a 3% interest rate. But the city contract locks us in only until 2030. And that's 22 years before the HUD loan expires or matures. Um, without the contract extension, we lose our shelter rent savings and we endanger our ability to make payments on the loan. This year, our tax payments were 4.7 million. If we had to pay full tax, the bill this year would have been 30.3 million. We'd have to find a way to raise $25.5 million a year just to pay the extra taxes. That would deprive us of money that we need to pay the debt service on the loan. It would call for a more than doubling of the carrying charge. <clears throat> That's why the urgency of the situation, why we call this meeting on such short notice, and why we're pursuing it on an ASAP basis. It's only a couple weeks ago that the HUD underwriters advised us that they were concerned about our ability to pay if we lost our tax benefits. They made the loan contingent on a contract extension for the full 35 years of the loan. <coughs> you mean? This has forced us to move rapidly. We want to lock the interest rate and close on the loan before an anticipated interest rate increase takes place when the Federal Reserve meets in December. Extending affordability is the second part of our win-win effort. City financial help. Brendan started to mention it, and let me touch on it a little bit as well. We've asked the city for financial help in two areas. One is J51. And uh, as Brendan, men Brendan mentioned, right now you can get J51 for new submetering, but not for replacement. Ours are now uh, something like 35 years old. They need replacing. And um, we don't get J51 for that. But the city has now agreed <clears throat> to modify the rules and give us J51 um, when we need it. it. Also, there was an issue of underground piping. Most buildings, obviously, are not like Penn South in a campus-style construction. So the J51 rules typically simply provide for piping within a building. They don't provide anything for the piping between our central power plant and our individual buildings. But they have agreed, the city has agreed to rewrite the rules and cover us so that we can get J51 for the uh, underground piping. And we expect to get about $4 million in real estate tax credits for this coverage. Surcharge. Again, our contract with the city requires us to share surcharge money with the city. Right now it's about six, 700,000 a year. We asked the city to allow us to keep 100% of that money. Um, 
we would use save it for the ten, first 10 years since we don't need extra money then. That would give us about six to seven million dollars available in 2026 and we could reduce the loan that we need to take out at that point to cover the work that's coming up in the second 10 years. And as I said, the city is supporting us at least at, at the HPD level and we're looking forward to a favorable decision from the Office of Management and Budget, which is now considering the matter. The slower growth in apartment prices, again, I'm repeating a little bit, uh, our pr apartment prices reflect several items. One is obviously the, e the amount you paid for your shares, the equity that you paid when you moved into Penn South. To that, it, we add any assessments while you're in the apartment and any amortization, namely the amount we paid uh, to reduce our underlying mortgage while you're in the apartment. That tells you how much you get when you move out. The apartment price is basically three times basic equity with the two-thirds of the price going to the first sales assessment reserve fund, which we use to pay the huge um, debt service that we had on the HVAC loan. The HUD loan, because it's for 35 years, will have lower amortization than the present loan, which has in part a 20-year schedule. This will reduce the rate at which apartment prices have been growing. It will help cooperators planning to move to larger apartments, particularly those with growing families. And let's look at some of the numbers. These are projected apartment prices five years down the road in June 2021. You can see what the price will be under the current loan what the price will be under the HUD loan and what the reduction in price would be if we accomplish the HUD loan. And then it's, on a per room basis, it's $4,700. And you can see for each apartment size what it will amount to. And it's significant. And so we're pleased to have that as a, another angle in our win-win. Uh, vote. The board has considered this HUD loan contract extension very carefully. It has unanimously supported the decision to extend our contract and take the HUD loan. But as always, we, on these items, we have come to the cooperators with an advisory referendum, and we want to hear your opinion and um, the board will take that into consideration when it votes eventually on finalizing its decision. Um, there are two ways to vote. You can vote on the proxy, which you will be getting in the mail fairly shortly. I guess within days, actually. And there are two boxes on the proxy underneath the candidates' names. You can see it. Option one on the left is I support the extension. Option two on the right is I oppose it. You check one box or the other box if you, to indicate your position uh, on the uh, extension. If you want to vote by machine in the building lobby, the same vote options are available. The language is similar. There'll be a lever to push on top for option one to support the extension or a lever to push down on option two to oppose the extension. Uh, and we urge everybody to vote and needless to say on behalf of the board, I urge everybody to vote for option one, the uh, extension and the uh, HUD contract is a real win-win for Penn South, and uh, we urge you to vote 
in favor of it. Um, now we're going to have questions and answers. And um, since I don't want to handle it alone, I'm going to ask Brendan and Morris to come back up. And uh, if anyone in the audience has any questions or comments, we'll be glad to take them. And uh, that will, I'm going to join them. Thank you, Walter, for a very clear presentation. And I think, thank you. Uh, we have, uh, Larry is going to be walking around with a microphone. We have two security gentlemen. So if you raise your hand, I'll try to get it to everyone, and we will try to answer all your questions. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Kathy Schnapper, Building 7B, 20B. First, I want to thank everybody who's worked on this, the members of the board and the management. Um, obviously, this is a complicated issue. I will also say out front that I expect to support this proposal. Uh, that having been said, I have some concerns that particularly uh, affect older cooperators, or at least those cooperators who've lived here a very long time in their apartments. Many of the, those of us who've lived a long time in our apartments, quite frankly, the apartments' interiors themselves need a lot of work. Uh, that work, of course, is the responsibility of the cooperators. For example, refinishing a floor, replacing a sink, those kind of things. Um, I have a 56-year-old stove, a dangerous one. Um, were this a normal co-op, it would be easy to go into a bank and get an equity, a modest equity loan of credit, revolving equity loan of credit, to do replacements that are the cooperator's responsibility. And my question is, is there any way, either through HUD or through the board or through um, our, um, um, what's the, credit union, thank you, that's the word, to entertain revolving loans of credit for those of us who have invested 30, 40, 50 years in this co-op and whose apartment are in need of work so that it benefits us while we're alive, not, the ne you know, not only the next generation. Um, you know, cabinets that are worn. There's, lot, there's lots of stuff in people's apartment if they've lived here for 40, 50, 55 years. So, so it's an excellent question, and thank you. Um, and I think what you're really, in a sense, talking is almost like a home equity loan, where you would borrow uh, uh, money to make improvements within the interior of your apartment. I would point out some of the interior uh, interiors that you mentioned is the responsibility of the co-op. And then, of course, things like replacing stoves or if you're putting in a new kitchen is something that uh, is your responsibility. Um, it's something we'll look into. Uh, the whole concept of being able to borrow money against the shares in the co-op is a relatively new one. The credit union, we were very fortunate to have the credit union in the beginning stages because, frankly, other banks were not interested in loaning money uh, for a couple of reasons. One, the loans were too small. Number two, the loans had to be held with the, in, within the bank's own portfolio. They, they weren't... Uh, uh, loans that they could sell off to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. So these were some of the difficulties that we had initially. We have worked through some of them. We now have Capital One, who's doing loans at a very, very advantageous interest rate for purchasing the apartment as well as the credit union. We have not gotten yet to the point of home equity loans, but it is something that we can look at in the near future and see if it's possible to have that done as well. One of the problems that I see is the potential of how, they would, how you would secure the loan, but it's something we can have discussions with banks uh, and see what might be possible in addition to our credit union. Uh, hi, uh, Brian Hammerstein, uh, Building 9, uh, candidate for re-election to the board. I wanted to ask if the replacement of household risers household water risers has been considered in either the first 10 years or the second 10 years of capital projects? 
Goldwoods. So the, I think you were referring to domestic water risers in the kitchens and bathrooms, uh, both hot and both cold. So uh, we, yes, an analysis was done. It's really not necessary. The good news is that this is one of the systems that actually doesn't need replacement. In the case of the hot water lines that run through and feed both our kitchens and bathrooms, they're what they call TP copper piping. And uh, they last uh, a lifetime, really. Um, in the case of the cold water, we've had not had problems. We have problems occasionally with the nipples, the threaded nipple, where it goes from the sink into the riser itself, and usually it fails at the weakest point at the threaded joint. But the risers themselves, we've not had any problems with, thankfully. So that was something we looked at, and in fact, it was something that HUD required us to look at, in addition to our underground sewer lines. We also had to look at our underground sewer lines and have them examined as well. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Peggy Kroll, and I'm um, in Building 7B, Apartment 3J. And maybe this is a really silly question, but why isn't the word limited equity being used here? I mean, isn't this just extending our limited equity to 2052? Or, Mike, I, I don't understand the wording of this, that's all. I don't understand shelter, rent, tax abatement versus limited equity. Okay. Uh, Do you want to answer that? Okay. Uh, I don't know how they came up with the term shelter rent precisely, but basically in setting taxes for the Mitchell Armour housing and other types of li uh, li limited equity housing, including even uh, Penn South originally, they had a system where the tax would be based on the income of the co-op, not the neighborhood in which it was located. And since housing provides shelter, and this was based on rent, they called it shelter rent. But essentially what it does is it ties it to the income of the co-op from its cooperators, reduced by the value of utilities used by the co-op, and you're pay, essentially paying something in lieu of regular real estate taxes, which is called shelter rent. I hope that answers the question. In our case, it saves us a huge amount of money. Namely, we pay about $3.5 million on our apartment buildings in taxes, and we would be forced to pay something in close to $30 million if we didn't have the saving. Hi, my name is Alex. I'm in Building 5, Apartment 7H. And um, I noticed earlier in your presentation, you did, uh, you displayed a chart uh, with projected um, apartment prices with the HUD loan uh, as opposed to uh, not getting the HUD loan. And I was wondering if there was a similar analysis done uh, to project what monthly carrying charges would be uh, with the HUD loan and without the HUD loan. Uh, no, the answer is that ca monthly carrying charges, we're expecting to remain where they are. Monthly carrying charges essentially pays for the operating costs of the housing development on a year-to-year -year basis, our operating costs. We will need to increase them from time to time, and that will have to do with labor contracts when they are increased for our, either our uh, maintenance personnel or our powerhouse personnel and any modest inflation costs that we have associated with supplies and materials that we will have to purchase. But by and large, our operating costs are very fixed. So we don't anticipate significant increases in our carrying charges, although we will from time to time have increases and we'll need to keep up with inflation and labor and so on and so forth. One of the requirements that we touched on tonight as part of the presentation is that HUD requires a 1% uh, mandatory 
uh, annual increase. Um, and that is you know, not by choice. We have to put it in place on all shareholders, and it's 1%. And it's meant to help to keep up with inflation. We estimated when we ran the number of 1% annually, it probably comes close, doesn't fully meet, but comes close to meet our, meeting our labor costs on an annual basis, assuming labor contracts in the neighborhood of two and a half to three percent. But our opera, the good news is that with the HUD loan, we actually are not expecting significant operating costs other than for inflationary type purposes. I hope that answers your question. Um, Ron Parker, AB 13A. I'm currently a uh, candidate for the board. Uh, for clarification, um, I certainly uh, am grateful for you fellows in the front that are doing such a good job on this. Keep on going. It really helps Penn South. Now, the self-liquidating, what does that mean? Does that mean the principal will be zero after the end of the loan? Yes. So, so, so let's just define the two types of loans that we're talking about. The loan that we have presently is what's known as a balloon mortgage. And essentially every 10 years, at the end of a balloon mortgage, it balloons, it matures. So at that point in time, you have to refinance the balance of whatever is left on the loan. And you often have options for uh, amortization schedules. In our case, we chose an aggressive 20-year amortization schedule. And, and I think it has helped to pay down some of the principal. The self-liquidating 35-year loan is very uh, commonplace, in some respects not undifferent to a loan that you would have if you purchased your house. It's a self-liquidating loan, and over the period of the 35 years, the loan uh, is completely paid. So you pay it down on an annual basis. The, the amortization schedule is, is a 35-year amortization schedule, and the term of the loan is 35 years, and therefore both end at the same time with a zero balance. Thank you. How about the HVAC charges? Are they going to increase? Are they going to disappear? Well, the, the, I, I assume that perhaps you're referring to the assessment. Is that, is that what you're referring to? Yes. Yeah. The assessment, as the board knows, was put in place uh, with the duration to end in 2021. In 2021, we will have to then evaluate what our financial situation is at that point in time and make a decision as to how we want to handle it. But yes, the, it was put in place until 2021. Hi, um, Cindy Levitz in uh, 6A's uh, 15H. Uh, first, I want to thank you for the work that you've done on behalf of the co-op. Uh, I think it's fabulous. And I, it seems like a no-brainer to me. I don't know what, um, I'm, you know, you have probably heard um, comments or questions that um, uh, would, would um, ask, you know, uh, or would support not supporting this. Um, what are some of the the questions that you've heard, what are some of the drawbacks that people have been worried about? Because it just seems like a no-brainer that we should support this. Well, it's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, I, I, I have sat uh, either on this stage or uh, on other stages over the years making the argument for why we should remain affordable, and it's often been a contentious argument because there's been people who have felt, no, we shouldn't. Uh, enter into a contract that, in fact, maybe we should do something different. I have to tell you, and perhaps uh, the amount of people that we have in the audience uh, um, kind of indicates that most people see this as what you've just said. It's a win-win. And, and that's what it was for us. There are so many positive benefits to this. It significantly outweighs any other option. And there are very few other options. For example, we're locked into a contract with the city until 2030 anyway. So 
or even if the, even if the concept of reconstitution uh, came up, you can't do it under 2030 anyway. And the savings on real estate taxes alone are so significant. We're talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of about 20, right now, and that will continue to grow, $25 million a year. And just to touch on what Walter said earlier, which I think is, is important, so, so this concept of shelter rent. The idea of shelter rent, which we were able to secure a number of years ago, was probably one of the better deals that we have ever done with the city. Uh, we are tied into a percentage of total income, and that's how our real estate taxes, that's how our real estate taxes are computed. In most other uh, buildings throughout the city that don't have shelter rent, your, your taxes are based on the assessed value of the property. The assessed value of Penn South now, we are arguably in maybe the first or second best neighborhood in the entire city of New York. So the assessed value is, is absolutely through the sky. So. That's the reason we would be, under normal circumstances, we would be paying a burden on real estate taxes in the neighborhood of $30 million, which would mean before you do another thing, you would have an immediate doubling of carrying charges just to meet the real estate taxes. You still have the capital program that we showed you tonight, and you still would have to figure out how to pay for that. So it's a win-win, and frankly, I have had nobody come to me, and, uh, and there's a number of people who often come to me about lots of uh, critical issues, um, but I've had nobody come to me on this and say it doesn't make sense or we should go in a different direction, because it's just as you said, it's a no-brainer. I'm Carol Cover in 7B. I'd like to also express my thanks to the board members and whoever worked on this. Um, my question is related to the one that has just asked. This is a win situation for us. But I'm wondering, has the city asked anything for, from us in return for this, or do you anticipate that they will? Okay, it's an excellent question. So um, the city has asked something of us. They have asked that we remain affordable until 2052. And we have in return asked that they give us the surcharge and that they give us the J51. And we'd be happy to do so provided, obviously, we had this advisory referendum. And the, as you know, the board has endorsed the program. So we don't see it being a big gift to the city to remain affordable until 2052, when we start off in the first year saving $25 million, not to mention the surcharge and the J51 benefits that we'll get going forward. It's a no-brainer. But I think you also need to understand that the city has a crisis, and the crisis is that there isn't much in the way of affordable housing anymore. Penn South's the beacon, we're the model, and we're referred to all the time. Um, and that's the city's challenge. And if you turn on, and, and I have New York one, and I listen to it every day, the arguments are tremendous um, all the time, continually now, on what the city is going to do about getting more affordable housing. It's a crisis in New York City. By the way, a crisis in many American cities. But um, the reality is that um, other than our extending the contract to 20, 52, which is easy for us to do because of the benefits. That's the only thing they've asked of us. Mary Alice Rudovsky, Building 5, 18E. Thank you so much. My question is directed to someone who a little while ago brought up uh, home equity loans. And while we very successfully talked about this HUD loan and taking care of our building structures with pipes and so forth and maintaining our 
structural aspect of where we live. There are internal aspects of bathrooms and bathtubs that are deteriorating. And is the co-op addressing any of that need and the needs of people as we age for having uh, no tub showers instead, renovated bathrooms that make it better and easier and safer for those of us who are aging. Is there any, um, any effort in trying to address that problem? Okay, so the answer to that is yes. Um, we have, um, a number of years ago actually, I think maybe perhaps about two years ago, the board through its operations committee spent a very significant amount of time deliberating over the concept of permitting people uh, to be able to install a shower stall in your, as opposed to a tub, so you could have a shower and you would not have to restore it at the point where you left the apartment. Um, so this is something that we spend a lot of time on. As a matter of fact, I recall that we had an entire newsletter that was devoted to just that topic in the bathrooms. In addition, if you call our maintenance department and you have a need for a bar to be installed, we do that now. Uh, 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 to, uh, uh, for cooperators. And yes, you can, uh, we, if you reach out to, through our maintenance department, we can make arrangements to have a contractor go visit you and install uh, or give you pricing on installing a new shower stall. The co-op does not pay for it. No, no, I know right. it would be an internal, since it's an internal renovation or, or construction, um, is there available to us a home equity loan? I know you were talking earlier no. about... Uh, no, that, that was what I just mentioned to this lady who raised it. Uh, yes. Uh, Unfortunately, at the moment, no. But it's something we'll look into. Uh, it's an excellent idea. Um, as I said, it's only recently that we were permitted to have any kind of loan on the apartment. So this is something we'll look into and we'll see what might be possible. Maybe possible through our credit union and, and other ways to have uh, home equity loans for some improvements that you might want to do in your apartment. We can look at that. I wondered if, if there were any, I wondered if there were any um, possibilities that would encourage this kind of rental, uh, not rental, uh, renovation money available to those of us who are um, handicapped? And is there a special kind of funding that would become available to people who, who need it on a health care basis rather than just improvement? And I wondered if the board could think of that as an approach to possibly uh, introducing that to banks, to various places, to the credit unions in an effort to make it easier for that kind of renovation to take place for people who are older and or handicapped. Yeah, the answer to that is yes. We can look into it, and we will look into it. It's available, I mean, for people who can afford it, if you want to convert, that's available now. You can, right now, uh, uh, convert uh, from a tub to a shower stall and so on and so forth. But with regard to the financing, that's something we'll have to look at, and whether or not there is some funding available to shareholders, uh, that's something we can look at also. We can connect with our senior center and see what might be potentially be out there, um, it's certainly worth looking into. Hi. Um, 
the other night, I think, oh, my name is Janet Buck. Hi. Um, I live in 3A, 11F. And uh, Walter, the other night you mentioned that Wells Fargo was the bank involved in w one portion or the other. Was it insurance or the actual loan? Was Wells Fargo? Wells Fargo is the initiator of the HUD loan, yes. Okay. Um, I've been reading some things in the news that Wells Fargo is having some trouble. Have you looked at other sources? We used to deal so much with amalgamated, and I was wondering what happened to that. Amalgamated don't do HUD loans, oh. and they're not a designated uh, uh, initiator. And the issues that have happened at, with regard to Wells have no impact on what we're doing with the HUD loan. So you trust them. Uh, hi, my name is Danny. I live in uh, uh, Building 6B. Um, I'm an environmental scientist, so I'm constantly thinking about uh, climate change and what the future projections. New Yorkers don't think about this a lot, but especially here, so close to the river, we're we're on the front lines of that. Um, and even like the rosiest projections do see sea level rises. When Sandy came, you know, the water came not that far from, from the co-op. So I'm wondering if there's any um, provisions within this, this HUD loan and within future capital uh, considerations for A, uh, adaptation, uh, or B, uh, greening uh, the way we make power, or other considerations uh, on, along those lines. Well, it's an excellent question, and, 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 and I will tell you that, that Penn South started in the mid 80s, and I remind people they were, that Penn South was co generating when it wasn't popular. Now it's very popular. And buildings are talking about it all the time, but we've been doing it since the mid 80s. So we're, we're, we always look very carefully at the environmental aspects of every project that we do. The other thing that is frankly encouraging is that now when you file with the building department on any project, there is now an energy code, and a very significant one, associated with any improvements that you make. And you have to comply with the energy code, and we learned this through our entire HVAC project. The other thing that we're working on very carefully, and I'm hoping that we can bring it uh, to fruition very soon, is we're optimistic that we may be able to get what they call an energy star designation for Penn South, which is really hard to attain. And in large part, we will perhaps get it because of all of the energy uh, uh, conservation type work that we've done through our HVAC project. Um, but everything that we touch these days in the way of a big project has an energy component. And we look very carefully at that. In our future, we're going to be replacing roofs. We are going to consider, and have considered, and will continue to consider green roofs as part of that. Um, so it, it's, you know, we, we carefully, the board carefully deliberates over these matters, and we do things professionally, and before we put together a set of plans and specifications that go out to bid, we look at all of the available options with regard to roofing, landscaping, an example over the years that we have done on our grounds, for example, rather than connecting into the sewer system, we have uh, dry wells in a number of areas that take all of the water from our grounds. And uh, as a result of that, it, we don't burden the city sewer system. So we're continually looking at things that we can do that are environmentally sound. We have a couple of people on the board who are very, very knowledgeable in this area and continue to remind us uh, when we look at projects that we need to keep an eye on doing things. With The pump rooms, unfortunately, most of the pump rooms were already underway and we had started a lot of work. It was not possible for us to move the pump rooms to a higher level. Um, but it is something that as we do projects throughout the development and where, where there is danger of the potential of uh, flooding and so on and so forth, we will, of course, take that into consideration and then raise the level. The water came to 20, on 23rd Street and about 10th Avenue when we had Sandy. So yeah, it was, it, it was let's put it this way, a little too close for comfort. So we're very aware of it and we, we, have, we bear that in mind with every project that we do. 
Good evening, Donna Marie Smith from Building 6A, Apartment 4D. Thank you to Walter for the well-written position paper. I have two questions, if I may be allowed to ask them. The first one is a follow-up to the cooperator behind me who, talked, who asked about the carrying charges. Since we're already required to put a month's uh, carrying charges aside for the current mortgage, and now it's gonna be three months, it seems a little bit dramatic considering we, ha I believe we have about a third of our cooperators who are on Social Security. On paper, it looks fine. I just wanted to verify that that is really going to happen, that we'll be able to put aside the three months carrying charges. Yes. Well, the HUD requirements for the loan um, are the requirements, and unfortunately, I will tell you, having gone through 12 months of this, there is very little leverage in terms of negotiating with them as to what you can reserve and what you can't reserve. And where there was flexibility, certainly, we had discussions with them. Um, but they have uh, very uh, uh, purposeful uh, reserves for various different things, including the operating. But remember that right now, under our existing mortgage, we also are required and have a very significant reserve memory serves me correctly, I believe we one have, to have one full month mm -hmm. of carrying charges from all shareholders in reserve. But do you understand what I mean? It seems a bit a dramatic increase. I, I, I understand that mm -hmm. it is, but and we expressed that to the federal government and they expressed that it is what it is. And, and unfortunately, it's not negotiable. So but we had to go along with it. The savings are so significant that it wasn't worth, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, there was nothing we could do about it. It's, it's also just, but, uh, let me just point out, the reserve is put aside very gradually. It will take us 10 years to, to build it up to the point where they want it right. kept. It is not something that we need immediately to do. It will be built up over time. Okay, that explains it. Now, the other question I had, is it my understanding from reading through all this material that we will not have any further assessments for capital uh, projects, except for the 1% that you said HUD re is mandatory, 1%, but no other further assessments like we've had for HVAC and for the windows for the next 20 years, is that correct? Okay, so let's just deal with the two things. One, the 1% is for our operating costs, okay, not for any capital improvements that we would necessarily need to make. We anticipate that we should not have assessments right now looking at all of our capital needs. We believe that we have covered them very well and we, we see no need for an assessment anywhere in the future. Now, I have learned, if I've learned anything in 25 years of real estate management, that it's a little bit like the politician that gets up and says, I won't raise your taxes, okay? Because I can make that promise and with all of the best intentions, but I don't know what the future holds. But right now, with our capital program in place and having looked at all of the details of everything that we need and what the costs are, and that's what's known as reasonable management, I believe that we should not need an assessment for capital anywhere that I can see in our future, okay? Hi, I'm, I'm Dan Gottfried, I'm apartment 7J in building 7B. I'm one of the newer cooperators here and I just wanna start by saying how incredibly impressive it is, the, the level of thinking and, and, and planning that goes into maintaining Penn South the way it is, it's just, you guys are <laughs> unbelievable. Um, I just had a thought as I was hearing. Thank you. I, I just had a, a thought as I was hearing um, people talk about the, um, uh, the difficulty with getting um, 
uh, loans in order to make improvements on apartments. And I wondered if you had looked into whether our position as a, as a big customer at some place like Wells Fargo taking this huge mortgage, whether we might be able to in some way leverage that into them making an agreement to provide loans to our cooperators, even though banks might not normally do so. That's an excellent question. And, uh, you know, we initially, when we started the, uh, the, the loans to purchase apartments, we had talked to an amalgamated bank, and we had also talked to a bank that was on our property, and our tenant, I don't know if you were here then, but it was Marathon Bank, it was located where New Care Pharmacy is now. And the difficulty that both banks have is that they're only permitted to carry so many loans within their own portfolio. And these loans that they would make are unfortunately not loans that they can sell into the secondary market. So that's one of the problems that the banks pointed out. Now in the case of Capital One, who's now doing home loans, they're doing it under the Community Renewal Act, where they get benefit by doing, lo uh, by doing loans to low lower income people, they get benefits for doing that, and that's why they do, the, Capital One uh, has the program. It's to our advantage, it's a wonderful program, and the interest rates are very competitive. But again, that's for the purchase of apartments, not for home equity. Home equity will have to be looked at very carefully. I live in a private co-op, and at one point I took a home equity loan, but it was secured on the value of the apartment and the shares in the apartment. And I'm not so sure how that would work here, and we'd have to look very carefully at it, and we'd have to work with the bank to try and see if it's possible. More likely that it might be doable with the credit union, um, because they're not necessarily held to the higher standard that sometimes banks are. So, but either way, it's something that was an excellent idea brought up by this lady here, and it's something that we will look into and see what might be possible. Um, it's, it's, it's a great idea. Hi, um, Meet Ali, Building 6B. Um, two quick questions, if I may. What is the current uh, secured and unsecured indebtedness of the co-op in total, and how much um, of, of that indebtedness, does the 190 million HUD insured loan pay off? Thank you. I believe that our, our entire uh, loan in Fannie Mae, the two Fannie Mae loans now is about 150, no, 170, approaching about 170 million. The balance the at balance, this point? The outstanding it's about balance. About 150 something, I think. 157, is it? Well, it was originally 134 plus 45, was 190 roughly. It's about, I think it's around 150 to 160. Yeah, in that neighborhood. It depends on what date you're looking at. <coughs> and, and, the, and the only other loan that we have is a HDC loan from the city, which is a very low interest loan, which we do not want to roll into the refinancing because it makes no sense to do it. It's a 1% uh, loan. Okay, uh, thank you. So that means that some of this 190 million uh, loan will does not pay off all of the, of the secured or unsecured indebtedness of the co-op. No, that's not. So so it so let it will all be paid off. It it's will all be secured. The, the 190 million dollar loan that we showed you tonight will be paid off over the 35 year period with a zero balance. I indicated it earlier. Um, the only loan that will remain on the property is the loan that we have with the HDC, Housing Development Corporation. And the reason that we're not rolling that loan into the refinancing is it's 1% money. It wouldn't make any sense to do so. So the answer is that at the end of the 35 years, the substantial debt that will be on the co-op will be paid off with the exception of the HDC no, loan. No, HDC will be paid off. Be, by then it'll be paid off. It'll be paid off, off also. Actually, by then it'll be paid it's off. It's paid off for 452. Yeah. As pay, pay, I think it was a 30 year, 30 year amortization. Something like that. Yeah. 
Um, if I may have the, it's Kathy Schnapper again, and if I may have the luxury of a little follow-up on that home equity. In the past, before HVAC, we used to have those appliance fairs and things that dealt with um, renovation. Uh, again, in some of the older apartments, uh, might there be the possibility of negotiating a better price for a lot of Energy Star uh, refrigerators, for example, or for a lot of, for a large number of safe stoves. My stove, I still light with a match, and, uh, and I shouldn't. Well, we can do an appliance fair. The last time we done an appliance fair, uh, it's quite a number of years ago. I, now, I, I, my guess is that it might be like seven or eight years ago, at More least. <laughs> we can look at doing another one um, for appliances. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's relatively easy to do. PC Richards and some of the bigger suppliers will come and they usually set up displays in one of our community rooms and, and they give a, 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 a usually a better price. <clears throat> so yeah, we can look at doing that. Hi, Sam Kegley in Building 6B. I have a few questions. Why would we have to replace the windows with this loan? Sorry, what was the question? Why would we have to replace our windows with year. this loan? Oh, okay. Well, like, why is HUD requiring this? Yeah. Well, what happens is that everything has what they call a life cycle. As you, as you do a life cycle analysis, everything has a useful life. And HUD has a sense uh, uh, of what that useful life is based on engineers' uh, reports and so on and so forth. So, yet yeah, the windows uh, will have to be replaced in time. I mean, we're talking about in, in a significant number of years from now, um, but yes, they will have to be replaced. Now, in all of these projections as to when items need to be replaced, if it's discovered that when you get close to that date that there are useful life still left in a system, such as windows or a mechanical system, whatever the case might be. You don't have to replace it just because you have the money reserved. The concept here is that you have the money reserved to replace it if you need to replace it. But if you can get another couple of years out of the, out of, out of the system and, and no damage has been done to the property, then there's absolutely no problem. Then we will wait until it needs to be replaced. Okay, and the other concern I have is what HUD and the city are going to require from us in terms of occupancy of apartments, in terms of uh, the maximum that you can make before you get a surcharge, because at one time it was eight times your rent, then it was seven, now it's six. What is... It's not six. Oh. It never went to six. All right, so it's seven, seven now. now. Okay, what do they project? Well, right now, there, there, there is no change in our contract with regard to any of the occupancy standards or the surcharge or anything of that nature contemplated. What, uh, the only thing that's contemplated in terms of the contract that we have with the city is an amendment to the contract to provide for the additional years of affordability and to provide for the 1% carry and charge increase that HUD requires. Okay, thank you. Are we good? Got a question up here in the back. Thank you. Um, this is, my name is Lisa Rubin, 3B7B. Thank you all for your work on trying to promote affordability and maintain it. Um, my question regarding the HUD loan is, has there been any consideration uh, or has it been deemed a waste of time to try to reach out to the federal legislators to see if they can help negotiate with HUD to ameliorate some of the aspects of the loan that we all are nervous about? Thank you. Good news is that we haven't needed our federal uh, 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 politicians to, um, to help us in this area, but we have, and, and if you were at the annual stockholders meeting last year, we made our keynote speaker, who discussed the HUD loan in significant detail, Jerry Nadler, um, and he's been available to us, and his office has been available to us. But truthfully, most of what we needed to get from HUD in the way of waivers and such, uh, we've gotten. Um, it, it, I didn't find it to be so draconian in, in the measures that they require. 
There are many ways to look at this. One can look at, you know, when you enter into a HUD loan, it's a bureaucracy and it's very difficult and they require all of these things. But you could also take a view that actually much of what they require makes good common sense and is good sound management practice anyway, and we should embrace it. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the due diligence reports and trying to understand what infrastructure needs to be replaced when, and the life cycle analysis studies associated with all of that, in my mind, is good sound business management practices anyway, and the board and management should want to do them and should want to know because it helps us plan intelligently. So we actually haven't had uh, that many difficulties, um, although I have to tell you that we have sent them a lot of paper. A lot of paper. Okay, it, lo it looks like uh, we've answered everyone's question. I just want you to know that HUD has done, as Brendan indicated, a massive investigation of our total property. They've visited apartments, they visited power plant, they visited the buildings, the lobbies, the infrastructures, and if we were getting a rating, we'd be triple A. HUD has indicated that this is one of the best properties that they've ever seen for a HUD mortgage, and the reason for that is most HUD mortgages are generally given to building owners who are looking to maximize their profits. So they borrow the money and they maintain their buildings as little as possible, but enough to get by. We don't do that, as you know, because you live here. We are very proud of the way our buildings are maintained and we give a lot of thanks to our Good. manager and our management team for doing that because Without them, we wouldn't be where we are. So uh, uh, thank you for coming tonight. And please vote and get your neighbors to vote and get everybody to vote, not just for the referendum, but also for the board of directors. And hopefully I'll see you and many more people at the annual meeting in a week and a half. Thank you again and good night.